Today on Central Illinois on the Record, the governor and lawmakers remain under fire after failing to pass a budget for the second year in a row. We've got a look at what's happening in the battle for funding. Plus, the governor's taking heat for comments about schools in Chicago, why some say his words were racist. And the state's medical marijuana program is getting a boost. How a new proposal got the governor to change his mind. Now, from your local election headquarters, this is Central Illinois on the Record. Welcome to Central Illinois on the Record. I'm Paul Cicchini. The state budget stalemate, it's the talk of the town in Peoria, Springfield, Chicago, just about anywhere you go. And the state was dealt another blow this last week as Moody's downgraded the state's credit rating. This affects approximately $26 billion in debt. The state's bond ratings are also being downgraded. Moody says the recent ratings reflect the continuing budget impasse and political gridlock that's been going on for over a year. A credit downgrade makes it even more expensive for the state to borrow money. Several social service programs will close or scramble to find money elsewhere next month. Comptroller Leslie Munger highlighting four budget bills signed into law that will need new money soon. The stopgap measures include temporary funding for higher education in K-12 schools. More than $20 million are paying for things like 911 centers and some federally funded social services like food stamps. Program leaders say some may believe things can't get worse, but they will if this isn't fixed. So just being able to access a hotline for domestic violence is a good thing. It's a positive thing, and I want people to keep doing that if they need to. But then the other steps are falling apart. Like the governor, Munger is advocating for a stopgap measure to pay for these services. Munger says we can expect more vendors to take the state to court since it's the only way they could be paid. Well, things took another turn last week when House Speaker Michael Madigan canceled Wednesday's session to discuss the budget. Despite the cancellation, though, he says working groups are meeting behind closed doors trying to iron out a broader budget deal. And Madigan staffers say session was scrapped because progress is being made. But some lawmakers say they should be meeting on the House floor. Continuing to stay optimistic because people are counting on us to come up with a budget solution and solutions to a lot of the challenges that we're facing. The House is scheduled to return on Wednesday. The Senate has not scheduled another session date. State Treasurer Michael Frerick says he's not surprised the state is entering a second year without a spending plan. He calls the situation disappointing. The one thing he'd like to stop seeing is blame. He says the longer we wait for a budget, the bigger the hole. When we're not able to make plans, we bring in less money. When we bring in less money, that's ultimately more money the governor and the General Assembly are going to have to raise in taxes or deeper cuts they're going to have to make in important social services like education. Treasurer Frerichs made a stop in central Illinois last week to hand out some money. We'll hear more from him a little later in the program. Well, Governor Rauner responding to the criticism and then some during a visit to Bloomington. CIOTR's Hannah Hilliard was there and takes a look at the continued finger pointing during the budget impasse. It's a visit we've seen before. When do you guys graduate? Governor Bruce Rauner touring a school before addressing administrators about the school funding budget battle, a battle hurting public schools across the state, including McLean County's regional alternative school, which will use reserves to get through the fall semester. That's why we had to do a six month contract, is because come the end of the fall semester, we will not be in a position to continue our programming as it currently exists. Every day I am fielding calls and inquiries from superintendents, school board members, and parents. That's why the governor and the local Republican legislators want to pass a standalone education bill, separate from the budget, that will fully fund public schools this coming year. So are you guys all studying together? The or? governor talked about that bill during his Bloomington visit, but also spent most of his time blaming one person for the current mess, House Speaker Mike Madigan. He wants the pressure of government services shutting down to create a crisis to force a bailout of the Chicago public schools. But the state funding plan for Chicago schools also brings more money to Peoria public schools and other districts in impoverished areas. Chicago gets a lot more, unfairly more. Peoria gets a little bit more, okay? You know what? I'd like to get uh, Peoria a little bit more. And in fact, in our budget, we get more money for most of the districts around Peoria. But even with Rauner's budget, the General Assembly is not in session to vote on it. And that's why the governor says it's now up to the people to apply the pressure. We need the people of Illinois to stand up 
Last week, we talked to Democratic Senator Dave Kaler, who says he's confident partial budget bills with an emphasis on education will pass before July 1st. Now, we've heard a lot from the governor, much of the time placing blame on Democrats for the lack of a spending plan. But the Senate president says Democrats have put helpful proposals on the table. Every school under our proposals will have as much as they had last year, and the, all the poorer schools will get more. That's what has to happen. We have the worst funding formula in the nation. There's no question about it. It's embarrassing. Senate President John Cullerton says Governor Rauner needs to stop campaigning and help to find a solution. Well, the governor says no budget means more crime. That's because programs like Redeploy Illinois are not getting money from the state. It's a program designed to keep kids out of jail. As of April last year, Redeploy served 45 counties through 13 program sites. Some have had to suspend services because they haven't received a dime since July of last year. Governor Rauner fears the closures will increase crime, and the only way to stop it is with a budget. And redeploy is a very important program. Now, the good news is we've been studying the numbers and the data. So far, we're not seeing any uh, increase in crime uh, related to um, redeploy being strangled by the lack of a budget. But at some point, it will. A law enforcement group called Fight Crime Invest in Kids has been lobbying for funding for this and various programs. Macon County says it's still providing assistance for offenders already in the program, but staff cannot afford to take new cases. Well, the governor's also under fire for comments he made while talking about Chicago's public schools. During a tour of Think Tank 1871, Rauner said there will be no state bailout for Windy City schools. He said many of them are basically crumbling prisons and not a place where a young person should be educated. Those comments drew criticism from a top Chicago schools leader. I think it's the most racist thing I've ever heard. I think that um, comparing a school, a place where I spent, you know, a large part of my life to a prison is just absurd. So that's my initial reaction. This all Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel also chiming in, saying Rauner sounds like he's auditioning to be Donald Trump's running mate. Well, Illinois State University is closing the Illinois Small Business Development Center at the end of this month, and you can blame it on the budget. Over the past 11 years, that center helped more than 700 businesses in McLean, DeWitt, and Livingston counties, creating an estimated 900 jobs. The director of the center says it is grant-funded, and ISU has to match that money by 50 percent. ISU is willing to pay its portion, but it can't foot the whole bill. Well, still to come, a medical marijuana breakthrough, how advocates of the medicine cut a deal to extend the pilot program. And stopping sexual assault, a look at the local push to prevent attacks. You're watching Central Illinois. You're watching Central You're watching Central Illinois on the record. The light sentence given to a former Stanford swimmer convicted of rape, reigniting a conversation about sexual assault on campus. It's a very real problem worldwide, including in Central Illinois. Lindsay Harrison spoke to local advocates about the issue, digging deeper into what can be done to stop these crimes. It's heartbreaking and um it's upsetting. To this week, the nation's eyes turned to California, where a former Stanford student was convicted of raping an unconscious woman behind a dumpster. Wasn't able to recognize um, 
that consent was not given and decided to go ahead and take something that wasn't his. 20-year-old Brock Turner was sentenced to six months of jail. Some call it only a slap on the wrist. Both he and his victim were drunk on the night of the assault on campus, and while alcohol is often a factor in sex crimes, local advocates want to drive home that it's never an excuse. Certainly not an excuse for the offender's behavior, nor is it a, a reason to blame the victim. Alcohol is a tool um, or a weapon used to sexually assault somebody. At Bloomington's Rape Crisis Center, Stepping Stones, leaders are calling on the community to help stop crimes like this here in central Illinois. McLean County is a very nice community, um, but sex assault does happen. Just like in the Stanford case, most of the sexual assaults reported in McLean County happen near one of the college campuses. But unlike in California, many of them don't end in a guilty verdict. Their idea of sexual assault is the stranger jumping out from the dark alley or behind the bushes. If we can educate the community that cannot consent is also just as illegal as a stranger sexual assault, I think that will go a long way. Stepping Stone says the key to stopping sexual assault entirely lies in community intervention. They have to be willing to, to step up and say something. Stepping Stones says community education is essential to rape prevention. The program does presentations and prevention training at other groups and businesses around town. Still to come, the state treasurer stops in central Illinois with a message for parents about college. We'll tell you what he had to say, but first, city leaders in Galesburg say lead is no longer a problem in the city's water. We look at recent test results. You're watching Central Illinois on the record. Recent water tests in Galesburg are in line with both state and federal lead regulations. The city said Monday it had two tests, a spring EPA test and an independent test, show the city is in compliance. Tests in the fall showed more than 13% of taps that were tested exceeded the EPA lead concentration level. The next water tests will take place this fall. More than 25 years later, money from Richard Pryor finally goes to its rightful owner in central Illinois, where the comedic icon got his start. Melissa Paldo takes a look at how thousands of dollars may spark future leaders in Peoria. Richard Pryor had written a check to help out this mission, but some of that money got lost. So we have collected that. That check was worth $19,000, but it never benefited the Carver Center until now all these years later. The center where people come for food and friends, even comedy, was a place near and dear to Richard Pryor's heart, a place where he got his start. You will find out that this place was instrumental in getting a number of people started. Uh, there are stories after stories. One of those stories belongs to Representative Jahan Gordon Booth. My first time ever having the ability to publicly speak was right here at Carver Center when I was about 12 or 13 years old. So when Gordon Booth heard that money was out there, she worked hard to bring it back, getting in touch with Richard Pryor's widow, Jennifer Pryor. 
it will continue to have um, a, an incredible effect on so many people as it did Richard Pryor and so many of the rest of us. To inspire the next generation, like 11-year-old Jonathan Nieves. This place, like, it keeps you, like, steady on track and everything. Lessons that maybe can't be learned in your classroom at school, would you say? Yes. Stories fill the halls with even more that remain unwritten. It's like discovering a talent that might be there that would not be discovered unless they have the opportunity to actually have that experience. The Carver Center calls it a blessing, saying it's grateful to have that donation, particularly during the budget crisis. Now, the treasurer's office says there are about $2 billion worth of unclaimed property. You can head to IllinoisTreasurer.gov to see whether you have any unclaimed property. Well, the state treasurer also letting students know the state believes in them when it comes to attending college. Michael Frerich spoke with local financial aid advisors last week, stressing the importance of putting a plan in place that helps students save for college with the state's 529 college savings plans. Frerich says with rising tuition costs, many parents are afraid college might be out of reach. Because we've seen tuition increasing at such a rapid pace for so long, students are coming out of college just burdened with debt. It not only is a problem for them, it's a problem for our economy because they're not going out and buying houses or buying cars or delaying starting families. So what we need to do is start today saving so that they can graduate with less debt and have more opportunities. You can find full coverage of the treasurer's visit at CIProud.com. Well, up next, growing the state's medical marijuana pilot program, how legislation is having an impact on patients and investors. You're watching Central Illinois on the record. All right, welcome back to Central Illinois on the record. I'm joined by Tim McGraw, the CEO of Revolution Enterprises, and Thomas Wolf, a Marine Corps veteran. So you two are joining me today because uh, some legislation cleared the General Assembly that expands the state's medical marijuana pilot program. It's something we've been talking about for um, almost a year now. We met in, in July of last year mm -hmm. talking about the medical marijuana pilot program and how it was just starting to take off after a, a couple of years of, of just kind of uh, uh, sitting around and, and not having any patients or anything like that. But a pretty big step the last couple of weeks. What happened? Well, we got past the politics of it. Um, what happened was we got uh, Republicans and Democrats together and they were actually able to work on a bill together for, for once. There was only seven pieces of legislation that passed this session, and uh, cannabis was one of them. Uh, and that's almost solely due to the fact that represent, or, uh, leader Jim Durkin got involved and acted as an advocate and uh, negotiated this along with Lou Lang and other Republican leaders like uh, the, Tim Butler. So it was really a collaboration between the administration. So we want to first off thank Governor Rauner for, for, for working with uh, Leader Lang and Leader Durkin to get this legislation passed. Uh, and we hope that his signature comes here in the, the next few days. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was an amazing collaboration between uh, Democrats and Republicans is why it got passed. But it wasn't easy. The governor was reluctant to add ailments to the pilot program, among them PTSD, which once he signs the bill is going to be included. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a game changer. It's going to save lives. 
lots of lives. Um, uh, hopefully, we can expedite the the, the signing and get P get it to PTSD or get cannabis to PTSD patients as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, it's 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 going to help quite a few people or thousands of people in Illinois. And Thomas, you included. Yes, sir. Uh, I've seen multiple brothers and sisters in arms suffering from PTSD alone and not getting the help they need. And I think that this getting past, it's going to save lives. It's going to get them off the alcohol, the opiates, the benzos. I think benzos are more addictive than opiates. And that's just what leads to harder stuff, and that's what leads to 22 a day. The 22 vets a day commit suicide. And it's because... Uh, There's one, one in five vets has PTSD. Uh, and that's a low number, as, as oh, Thomas would. Yes, I believe it's higher than one in five. I, that's just a low count. I know countless brothers I've served with that are undocumented or don't want to speak up because there's, there's almost a stigma with PTSD. People think there's something wrong with them and they can't, can't be helped. But medical marijuana, it help, it'll help ten times better than all these opi opiates and benzos. And it's saving lives. Well, it's got to be difficult, too, because... In the military, I mean, you're the, the best of the best. You're, you're kind of at the, at the top of the heap. And then to come home and to suffer from PTSD and to be basically debilitated but not necessarily have any physical ailments has to be incredibly difficult. It, every day it makes your skin feel like it's crawling. When I first got home in two thousand back out of the Marine Corps in 2013, I don't know, I looked at civilians like caged animals. And it, you can't. You feel alienated. And the only answer that we give vets right now is that combat cocktail. Here's your, here's your antidepressants, here's your opiates for your pain, and then wash it down with some alcohol, and that's, and that, and that's how we're treating PTSD right now. So uh, something had to change, and I think that the, it was just overwhelming support for the program, first off. I mean, uh, the, the Paul Simon poll, poll was at 83%, so it keeps going up. Uh, but with PTSD, it's just really the right thing to do. I mean, it, it's something that needed to be added to the program. And something else that changes in the, with this program, uh, with this new legislation, is the way that doctors and patients interact. It does, the doctor doesn't have to recommend medical marijuana anymore. And that's, that's a kind of a game changer when it comes to access. It, uh, it is, for sure. Um, the, the, the intent in the law originally was that doctors just certify the patient have a, has a condition, which is the way it's being uh, amended to. Uh, the recommendation language that was, that was added later on was not the intent. The, so <clears throat> a lot of doctors were refused to do this, or a lot of doctors' groups would not uh, recommend, but they'll certify. They'll, they'll certify that you have a condition that it's listed, but they don't have enough inf information, or they don't feel they have enough information or experience with cannabis to give a reason why they recommend it. And that seems to be the very consistent theme when it comes to medical marijuana because of the way the drug marijuana itself is scheduled in the United States versus what researchers are able to do around the world. That might change here. June 29th, uh, there's a the DEA is supposed to release potentially a rescheduling. Uh, we don't know if it'll go to Schedule 2 or Schedule 3 or not be rescheduled at all, but there'll be a decision by the middle of the year. Uh, it it seems like at least there's a lot of momentum uh, as states across the country continue to uh, not just embrace medical marijuana, but marijuana legalization. Well, I mean, it's, it's the, as far as the schedule change goes, I mean, a Schedule 1 drug by definition has no medicinal value at all. That's obviously not true with cannabis, so it definitely needs to be rescheduled. Uh, it's just what schedule do they, do, do they move it to? But it will be a game changer for the industry. It'll, uh, it'll change a, a lot of things on the, on the banking side, uh, just all across the spectrum. So. Well, and one of the things that, um, it, at least in terms of rescheduling, if in fact that happens in terms of, of research and studies, Revolution has done a study of its patient, or its marijuana that's gone to it, medical marijuana to its patients. Mm -hmm. What does this mean now that you're adding ailments? Is there another study in the works, uh, oh, yeah. at least maybe ahead of rescheduling, and then who knows what happens if that, in fact, changes? For sure. We're uh, working on the second study right now. It's uh, going to be more targeted. Uh, we're going to have, obviously, more patients now to study. Uh, the first study, we only did a, we did a short, very short uh, window. It was only like 30 days. We're going to extend the window to get a lot more data. Uh, but the data that we got in the first, the first study was invaluable. I mean. Uh, what it did tell us, I think I mentioned last time there, is what we already know is that cannabis works unbelievably well for pain, for the treatment of pain. Um, and we have an opiate uh, addiction epidemic in this country. And um, a lot of it's, 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 you know, 
it's easily solved. There's not easily solved, but it's easily uh, reduced, like the states of Colorado and Washington, Oregon, that see a 25% reduction in opiate abuse, addiction, overdoses, all of those uh, if you can use cannabis to treat pain. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for, uh, for sitting in and talking about uh, this new medical marijuana legislation that has yet to be signed by the governor, but uh, we anticipate it's going to happen. Yeah, it was agreed to by the administration, so we, 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 uh, we stand by. All right, Thomas Wolf, a Marine Corps veteran, Tim McGraw, the CEO of Revolution Enterprises. Up next, inclusion in the Twin Cities, how not in our town is celebrating 20 years. You're watching Central Illinois on the record. Not in our town, a group promoting inclusion in the Twin Cities will soon have a 20 year celebration. During a press conference at the McLean County Museum of History, supporters of Not in Our Town announced the plans for downtown Bloomington. The event will feature music, entertainment for kids, and a short commemorative march. The goal is to connect with the community, creating a place where everyone is welcome. It's just people coming together of every race, of every uh, belief system, and saying that we care about one another. Everybody has something to bring to the table, and that's what I love about Night in Our Town. The event will be from 6 to 9 p.m. on June 28th outside the McLean County Museum of History. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of Central Illinois on the Record. Of course, you can stay in touch with us using social media, connect with CIOTR and me on Facebook and Twitter using the hashtag CIOTR, and we'll see you next week. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of WMBD, WYZZ, or Nextar Broadcasting Group.